Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are the research vessel FALCOR, operated by Schmidt Ocean Institute, and you are joining us right now live from the Indian Ocean. We are currently on an expedition here exploring a couple of canyons off the western coast. I have with me the science team. They are tucked away in our library right now, and I will introduce you to them in just a moment. First, I'm going to show you just a quick overview of where we've been all the mapping that we have done, and then I'm going to send you off to the science team to explain a little bit more about what this expedition was about and some of the highlights that we have seen and explored on this current cruise. Today was our last live ROV dive, so if you were able to join us, that's wonderful. If not, please feel free to find all of our ROV Sebastian dives on Facebook and YouTube. Um, we are going to have a bit of a show for you this evening. We're going to go through some of the things that people have seen and their favorites, and then we'll take a period of questions at the end of it. So please continue and join with us tonight. Come up with those questions for the science team, and I will show you a little bit of our mapping. So as you can see, that was the research vessel Falcor. We are currently off the coast of... Australia. And this is some of the multi-beam data that we've been collecting as well as backscatter over the evenings and whenever we're not diving. So you can see there's a small dots on each of the on the map and those were the places that we actually dove with ROV Sebastian and did some of our exploration. So I'm going to back up that video real quick. Sorry, bear with me. And we're going to take you live to our library. So go ahead, Narita. I have um, science, um, as well as so what has this expedition? Uh, Eastern Indian Ocean, chips and travel and things like that has been a little bit challenging. But uh, we've just been focusing on enjoying the science and, uh, and bringing that to as many people as we can. Awesome. Would you like to show up to the surface? There's long periods where we're sort of transiting through water and we often have interactions with large uh, cephalopods like this. And I had noticed something for to collect these large animals and thought about little interaction. And you can actually see uh, bits of skin and mucus, which afterwards we're able to uh, collect and, and fix in ethanol and we'll be able to get DNA sequences from that sample. So it's a great way to sort of extend our capabilities. And I think that we've got uh, nicknamed the Kitchen Brush of Science by people on, on Facebook and YouTube when we first started using it. So, so we're calling it a, a K-Boss, and, and that will be its official name from now on. So you can see that the squid there is sort of grabbed onto the brush quite um, strongly. And, uh, and it just leaves a little bit, you can just see little pink flecks um, on that brush there. And so we just pick those off with forceps later to collect that sample. So this um, video was quite interesting to try to collect, um, and we take stills, and this still was actually taken by our lead uh, marine technician, um, Paul Duncan, who you can see in the light blue shirt all the way to the right. Um, and I'm going to forward it on to our next explorer. Sorry, everybody at home, we're experiencing a bit of technical difficulties with the um, video feed. So if in the beginning it kind of came in and out, please make sure you ask questions about the part you might have missed. And I'm going to um, start this video up one more time. So I'm Andrew Hosey. I'm the curator of Crustacea at the Western Australian Museum. And my favorite moment of the of the trip was when this little squat lobster, a kind of uh, small, small crab-like animal, uh, decided to take a closer view of the ROV Sebastian, possibly suffering a little bit of a manipulator or pin pincer envy. Uh, possibly wanted some of his own coated in titanium like uh, the Sebastian has. So he decided to cuddle up a little bit to the ROV, uh, not, not at all practicing social distancing at all. So we thought we'd uh, sample him, so he was so keen, and we grabbed him with the suction. Andrew, can you talk a little bit about how challenging it might be for the ROV team to do these collections? Do, they, do the squat lobsters actually try to swim away at all? Yeah, they'll flick their tails much like a, a shrimp will to escape rapidly backwards, quickly swim away. Uh, but the ROV guys make it look exceptionally simple, and there you go. Bang! So our next guest... 
Uh, my name's Glenn Moore, I'm the Curator of Fishes at the Western Australian Museum and I had a lot of trouble choosing my favourite but I ended up settling on the faceless cusk. This fish uh, is a bizarre fish, it's a true deep sea specialist, it's really only found between three and five thousand metres. It was only known in Australia from a couple of records in the Pacific coastline so this is a, a big extension for us and it's the first records for the whole of the, the western half of Australia. You can see it's a bizarre, bizarre looking thing with a big gelatinous head and those spots that you can see that look like eyes are actually nostrils so this, this fish has no eyes whatsoever and these strange little underslung mouth that you're getting a good view of now um, in a moment you'll see a still where the mouth swings open but it, it hunts crustaceans mostly picking them up off the seafloor but for me um, apart from the fish it was seeing the ROV pilots using a, a hand net and uh, using the manipulator arms to catch lots and lots of different fish for me. It was a good challenge for them. I don't think any of them had actually um, many, uh, had an opportunity to do that in the past, so I gave them a, a challenge to, and they, they excelled at it, there's no doubt about that. There you can see the mouth open with the forceps there. It's a really strange looking thing. And yeah, those definitely look like eyes, but they're nostrils. Very interesting fish. All right, our next guest is... Hi, I'm Janelle Ritchie. I'm a technical officer at the Weir Museum. And this was one of my highlights. It's the Hymenasta Slime Star, not the Slim Star. Uh, a little bit <laughs> happy, but really, really lovely. Uh, I don't think we have very many of these in our collection, so it was really interesting to have a look at it. Um, in situ and also in the lab, we got to take some amazing photos. And we think they use uh, slime as a defense mechanism, so it was super cool to watch. And also, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the Schmidt Ocean Institute and our, uh, our VFALCOR crew for looking after us so well. Thank you so much. What was your favorite thing about this organism? It's so bizarre. It's so fleshy, and I love the slime. I think it's a great method. Think about maybe taking some on, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, the video is almost up next. If you want to pass it on, I think... Lisa's up. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lisa Kirkendall. I'm the curator of mollusks and the head of the aquatic zoology department at the Western Australia Museum. This was my favorite treasure of the trip. It's a sea cucumber, also known as a treasure pickle now. And you can see it's beautiful and glittery. It's covered with shells that the animal has collected from the bottom of the ocean. So it's helping us do our job. It's actually contributing to our biodiversity survey. And what's really significant is some of the shells that are on the surface of that sea cucumber, we didn't find anywhere else during the course of the, of the cruise. So it's really added to some of the records we like to contribute. So dead shells matter. Um, and you can see the wonderful interaction we had um, during the chat sessions uh, with different people. And it was actually the original Pollywog who came up with the name Treasure Pickle that we've gladly embraced. So it's been really fun out here. Thanks so much. Okay, I think this is just the last few shots. Um, I find it really interesting. Lisa, how many different shells were on that? Do you know yet? We've been quite busy out here, so that's actually a job I've saved for when we're back <laughs> in Perth, and um, I might be home counting them <laughs> while I'm in isolation. <laughs> so a lot of work still to come. Absolutely. Okay, David, you're up. Hi, my name's David Yushkevich. I'm a PhD candidate from Curtin University and a student of Opportunity um, with the Schmidt Ocean Institute. So my specimen, I had many favourites, but one of, the, one of them was the Cycroptes longi quarter. So it's a holothurian, a type of sea cucumber. Um, this one's quite interesting because of its kind of um, protruding um, kind of tail. Um, it's filled with a lot of fluid and yeah, I just found it quite um, interesting as it reminded me of a lot of things. Um, so I think it's quite actually quite beautiful, the colour. It's got this kind of almost like a fluffy tail that's following it. Um, it also did have a lot of scale worms following it. Now my chief scientist said it's a lot similar to a squirrel and I do kind of see that, but in my mind I think it's more of a lint brush. <laughs> 
Great. David, real quick before you pass it on, if um, I know, sorry, you guys are moving a speaker along. Can you just quickly talk um, really quickly about your student opportunities? Can you tell everybody at home kind of how that came about, just for people who might be interested in getting involved in that? Yeah, sure. So one of my supervisors, Dr. Zoe Richards, um, is part of the WA Museum, and she wasn't able um, to join us on this trip. So she kind of led the pathway to connect with our chief scientist, Nerida Wilson, to give me this opportunity to be part of the WA Museum team. Um, and then, of course, the Schmidt Ocean Institute then supported me um, to be on this trip. So that's kind of that's how everything fell into place. Um, and it's been really fantastic um, learning about all the different teams and crews that work on the ship and how to work um, during these types of scientific expeditions and such cruises. Yeah, it's been fantastic. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, let's see. Who do we have up next? This is sort of like, uh, ah, Georgia. Um, I'm Georgia Nesta. I'm also a PhD candidate from Curtin University and a student of opportunity. Um, I do the eDNA work on board at the moment and my favourite moment was this cusk fish because we had a gruellingly long day uh, filtering water and I turned around and looked at the TV and this guy was like a little puppy dog and he just looked so happy and it was just a really fun chase I guess. Yeah, so interesting about these cuss fish. So there was a bunch of them that were sort of gathered around the landers and fish traps that we'd put on the seafloor. And, um, and I think that moment, which I will rewind for everybody at home, had a really close up and he just wanted to say hi. Okay, next up we have Casey. Now, many of you have heard Casey's name. She has helped with our um, uh, video on all of these ship to shores. Casey, what do you find very interesting, sorry everybody, um, about this? Yep, so my name's Casey Hanley, as Deb just said. So I'm from Macquarie University. I'm a Master of Research student there. And so I came along on this trip as a little extra to try and help out wherever I could. And so one of the things I did while I was on uh, the Falcor was to help with annotating videos. So I was in the control room a lot during the dives and this is one of the moments, uh, this squid, the Dana octopus squid, when it came into the uh, camera, the video for uh, on the control room feed, everyone went insane. <laughs> it was one of those moments where I think no one knew what they were seeing, well we knew what we were seeing but we couldn't believe what we were seeing. It was just insane. It's got these two photophores um, on the, I think, the bottom of it, and they just flash. And it looks like it's like sending out some SOS signals or it's a warning. It's amazing. And I think we kind of all lost it for a moment in the, and it came a few times actually. A few days later, we saw it again. So it somehow had some sort of interest in the, uh, the ROV. It did like Sebastian, we discovered. But yes, there you go. All right. I'm Paul Duncan. I'm the lead technician on board Falcor, and uh, I found the sharks just amazing. Most of the times uh, when Sebastian is coming up the top few hundred meters of water, we'll see small fish and occasionally um, bigger fish, such as mahi mahi. But uh, it's very rare that we see a shark, and much rarer that we see like four of them there. So this was just amazing. These are oceanic white tips, uh, identified by Glenn, and uh, they're just pretty cool. Really, really cool to see these. So I'm going to ask the group, um, you know, this shark bit is a bit long, and I'm going to let it play so the people at home can kind of experience some of the video that we've been seeing. But um, so for the team, what are some of the other um, great accomplishments you feel like you've really had within this expedition? So I know that each one of you have been working on different parts of this expedition and really trying to collect as much information as you can to bring home to you, uh, bring home with you, sorry. Um, what else are you really excited about looking forward to exploring from the data that you've collected here? Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I do the EDNA work on board, a lot of my 
work just involves water and paper. Uh, so I am most excited to actually see my data and see all the species that I've detected and maybe what the ROV did pick up or what it did pick up and just, yeah, it will be really awesome to actually see what I found. <laughs> So for those of you at home who probably have never seen this view, this is actually the rear camera on RV Sebastian as we're recovering the vehicle. So you can start to see in the video, Falcor comes um, as sort of a shadow, and that's actually the umbilical cable that Sebastian's attached to. And as the vehicle comes up through the water column and slowly um, gets closer and closer to Falcor, we over the last couple of days have had quite a few visitors. So we'll leave you with some of that footage, and I'll probably fast forward just a little bit. And yeah, you'll see the propellers of Falcor. It's quite a very clear water view. Um, it's one of my favorites, actually, watching the vehicle come out of the water and get pulled up onto deck. Um, and it's really quite fun. So this is actually um, the next image that you see up there is my favorite. Um, this is a Tina 4. My name is Deborah Smith. I am one of the marine techs on board and I have been joining you on these ship to shores. Um, these are really one of the coolest midwater creatures I think that we've seen. Um, they reflect the light of the ROV um, and they're really interesting because I think that they are very delicate and they just have this amazing structure that kind of changes and forms as the flow of the water from the ROV goes by them and they just have this beautiful reflective light. And they are just kind of one of these really interesting mysteries of the midwater. And we don't tend to spend a lot of time in midwater, so it's really quite fun to see them when we're um, coming up through the water column or going down through the water column. So that is my favorite from this expedition. We see them quite often. Um, siphonophores as well are quite interesting in the water column. And um, so we have a message from ROV Sebastian for you guys wash your hands but I'm gonna pause the video here and actually rewind it a little bit I'm gonna go back to our science team in the library and I would like them to answer some of your questions at home so now's your chance please write in I will um, read off the questions to the team and we will try to get you some answers so now's your chance everybody at home Anybody? Questions? Ah, so James has a great question. Narita, you might want to talk about this. We briefly talked about speaking about it at the end. James is interested in the samplers that were left for recovery in the future. Can you talk a little bit about the arms and what the plan for them is? Sure. So um, the sort of plastic, grey plastic little stacks that you saw us deploying are called autonomous reef monitoring structures or arms. And they're used quite widely around the world for shallow reef monitoring. And they're essentially a quantifiable um, surface to understand what animals might settle there. Um, and the they haven't really been used in the deep sea before. So uh, the work that we're doing here is just a really a very experimental experiment. Um, and we'll come back and pick them up in a few years time. Uh, some of those processes happen a lot slower in deeper depths than you might find on a shallow coral reef. So we need to allow enough time for animals to settle on them. And then we'll retrieve them and uh, sequence those animals and count them uh, and get an idea of how quickly those processes might happen or at what different rates they happen in the deep sea. And I'd also just like to do a quick shout out to Martin from Argentina and Alejandro uh, from Mexico, some old colleagues of mine. Hi. <laughs> Great. And Lloyd, I think um, Nerida just answered your question about what's next. Um, you know, it takes um, quite a bit of time to plan expeditions. Um, scientists put in proposals to Schmidt Ocean Institute to use the research vessel Falcor for their expeditions, um, but that planning can take upwards of one to two years, um, and so we're always planning um, for what's in the future. As to what's in the near future, um, we are headed into port now, and we will be headed into Broome here in the next few days, and then Falcor will be repositioning to another port. Um, we may be doing some science exploration along the way, but we have yet to flesh all of that out, so stay tuned, and we will try to keep you informed when we have the opportunity. 
Okay, team, I'm not getting a lot of questions from home. Anybody else want to um, jump in with a question against anybody? Talk about something? Janelle? Hi, Mom, love you. <laughs> All the highs from home. Um, we do have a question from Jessica. The catalog of animals you have witnessed must be enormous. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a book made of everything you guys have witnessed? You people have the coolest jobs. So can somebody talk about the book? Do you have a book, a catalog, a database, something? Well, isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> Jessica, We one of the outputs or deliverables of this cruise for us will be to um, make an online guide available of the animals that we've seen. It'll take a little bit of work to compile them. We have so many amazing images from Sebastian and the team here. We have to pick carefully um, the best ones and identify the species that we'll include in that guide. So stay tuned, it's coming. Great, so there's a question from Alejandra. Is anyone doing microbial work? I think the answer to that is no. <laughs> so if you're a microbial scientist out there, Maybe you're next up on an expedition. Um, some of our favorite creatures, were any of them new species? So I know that there will be some publications yet to come, but would anybody like to talk about potentially things we've seen that might be new species? I will start a little bit. Um, there was a question earlier about what's next, because that's also a big part of what's next, is we need to take what we found here. There's only a limit to how much we can do in terms of identifying them while we're on the ship, so everything has to go back and then we start trying to figure out exactly what we've got. Of course we've got a feel for what we're seeing and we think we know some of them, so there'll be some disappointments where we think it's a new species and then we'll find out that somebody described it 150 years ago, but there will be lots of things in amongst that that are basically new to science and that's where for us the real excitement comes, that's the sense of exploration that uh, an opportunity like this gives us. So. There is, I would say, almost certainly new species amongst what we've got across the whole team. So, um, yeah, but of course the process of naming new species can take years, so hold your breath, uh, or don't hold your breath, <laughs> because, uh, it, yeah, it, it will happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen uh, in the sort of really quick time frames. So I think you've answered, but we had a question from Neil, who is one of our engineers on board, by way of Jason, who is one of our ROV pilots, so they must be watching in the crew mess, um, wants to know how long it takes to name a new species. So there you go, guys, about two years or longer or shorter, I'm sure, depending on how challenging it is to find information from other people doing the work. Um, let's see, Curtis would like to know, what is one of the largest species that was found at depth? That's probably one of your fish. Yes, it would have been the fish. It, I'm still not 100% sure what it is. I think it might be a giant cusk, but I say that uh, with trepidation um, on, on a public forum. But it was on the dive yesterday, I believe, and right at the start of the dive, if you go back and watch it, and it's an absolutely stunning fish. There is no way we would ever have caught it. We had nothing on. It was almost as wide as the front of, of uh, the ROV. It's a beautiful fish, and some of the... the most beautiful footage that we've got uh, just in the in the dark it was absolutely stunning great so we have a few more questions coming in um, I'm not going to answer Jason's second question about karaoke I think that was our previous entertainment this evening before our live ship to shore we do have a karaoke machine on board and everybody enjoys singing um, how many specimens were collected so do we know this number yet um, we do, we're working on that statistic right now, and we'll be uh, announcing that in an upcoming video that wraps up kind of end of cruise, so just hold on tick while we get those final numbers in. And yet, no heckling, Jason Rodriguez, thank you very much about karaoke, you just stay down. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's a question about geology on the seafloor. Um, part of our geology team was not able to join us on this expedition. They were supposed to join us in the second leg. Um, and due to the circumstances of putting new people on board, um, they weren't able to. Does anybody in there want to um, pretend to be a geologist for 30 seconds? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> I, I think I would just direct people to maybe check out the blog that the people from Geoscience Australia put together. Um, they can certainly talk about things much more authoritatively than we can, so the resources are there if you're interested. Yeah, and I'm sure there's still some exploration to sort of do. We would collected quite a bit of multi-beam data and backscatter, and I think all of that data goes into being analyzed once um, it gets back home. 
Um, there's a question about how you're going to transport transport all the samples back to Perth. <laughs> There's a lot of paperwork and a lot of dangerous goods compliance that we're fine to get uh, freight back from from Broome to Perth. A lot of work on both sides, in, in Perth and on the bike. Um, let's see. Yeah, well, by, tra uh, by trucks on the road. Trucks, yeah. Very delicately. Or bouncing down the road. Hopefully not. Um, there was a question about, and I've lost it now as it goes by. Um, is it from Laura, perhaps? I think it's from Laura, perhaps, but I'm not quite sure which. Um, I can see it. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. Hi, Laura. I love you. Um, <laughs> Satsuma, by the way. You wanted me to say Satsuma, so Satsuma. Um, <laughs> Yes, we did catch a few things that could be uh, worth putting on show in the, the, the upcoming WA Museum, which is still under, under construction and currently due to be completed in October, November this year. Uh, we are working on ways on how to actually integrate a lot of the footage, uh, as well as specimens, into gallery spaces, into, into the new museum. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be able to do that. Um, and James's question is, who's going to recover the arms? I'm sure that you're all looking forward to trying to do that yourselves. <laughs> We'd love a little bit of help from Falkor. <laughs> Schmidt Ocean Institute, please. <laughs> so there's the plug for 2020-something. 20, 20 <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about that. Um, if you are interested in exploring with Research Vessel Falcor, there's always periods of the year where we take um, proposals and expressions of interest. So if you are a scientist or researcher out there, uh, make sure you check out our website, schmidtocean.org, and um, they'll always put out um, a notice there for expressions of interest of work that you'd like to do and exploration that you're interested in. Um, we are in Australia for the next year, um, and um, to be determined after that, we usually get the schedule about a year in advance. Um, Jason says he picks things up and puts things down. That's about right. So, oh, yeah, so that's, that's important, though. Uh, none of the work that we do um, collecting this amazing biodiversity in these canyons would be possible without the support of the team, the ROV team are just phenomenal at doing very delicate manipulations with the Sebastian arms. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's like ballet to watch them work. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one of the for people that are interested in, in putting in applications to work on the Falcor, I think it's really important to understand how special this program is. Um, we're taken care of so well with you know, very, very skilled technicians for the ROV, but also on deck with all the operations, things like launching CTDs and mapping, Deb, your passion. Um, you know, it's just fantastic to work with such enthusiastic and supportive people. It's just a real pleasure. So uh, the food's amazing, the boat's amazing, everything's amazing, and we don't really want to go home. <laughs> Jimbo's amazing. Jimbo's amazing. Um, there is probably another question for Glenn. The tripod fish that you guys caught, is that a fairly new species and something that just lives at depth? I think that the tripod fish that we've been seeing is um, is actually already described. There's, um, oh, you caught me off guard. There are quite a few species in Australia already and I'm not entirely sure what it is. We, we do have one that we managed to, to keep. Um, we had one today in the net, but it managed to escape, and that was Jason, he, who's uh, been stirring us from the text, so I can stir him back now. <laughs> oh, miss sample. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's certainly it's a deep water specialist, and yeah, it, only in the very dark waters, so where there's no no sunlight penetration at all. Amazing. Okay, everybody at home, there's just a little bit more time if this is your chance with this science team and the end of this expedition as we're headed back into port. Any more questions about this expedition, about the Research Vessel Falkor, Schmidt Ocean Institute, we're here to answer those questions. Thank you for coming along, this, along on this journey with us. This will be our last ship to shore for a little while, um, and we thank you for joining us on these expeditions and these um, fun nights of learning about science. We hope everybody is staying 
staying safe at home. And there's a question, do you use the science equipment crates? <laughs> Thanks, Toter. So we have some um, of our crewmates chiming in from home, and he wants to know about our science equipment crates. Um, sometimes we fill them with water, Toter. I think you're quite aware of that. <laughs> and we might warm that water up. Um, so there's some questions about whether or not we're you guys are nervous about re-entering the population in light of the coronavirus. Um, and obviously there's always some concern about the ship going in. Nerida, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, and I can address it from SOI. Sure. It's been, you know, I think a bit of a, a strange time in the world. And, and we kind of uh, stepped onto the ship um, before things got really crazy. So uh, we've kind of been watching this all unfold from a bit of a distance. Uh, you know, I... Nervous, not necessarily. It's it's definitely going to be very strange. Um, I guess what we're worried about is that people have been adapting very quickly to new behaviours, and we're kind of a, a naive bunch of people that um, haven't yeah clearly are not social distancing very well <laughs> <laughs> because we're all healthy here together. So um, we're just going to have to change our habits pretty dramatically, pretty quickly. Um, but we've been you know working on reminding each other about that and. Uh, yeah, it'll be nice to get back to our families as well. Great. Um, Lily has a question, how large was the Joan? Lily, I'm not quite sure which Joan you're speaking about. If you're talking about ROV Sebastian, there's some details on our website, Schmidt Ocean Institute. There was also a ship to shore um, a couple weeks ago that specifically talked about ROV Sebastian, so you can check that out on our website um, off the top of my head, and maybe Jason can chime in, um, but I think we figured out it was a few meters high by a few meters wide. So, um, and it, ROV Sebastian is not a drone, it's actually um, a vehicle that's piloted. So we have pilots that actually fly it from the control room and it's completely tethered to the vessel at all times and this allows us to get the video data and the, um, the instrument data and then the pilot's instrumentation and commands down to the vehicle in near real time. So I think that will be um, our completion of our show tonight. We thank everybody for joining us. I'm going to send you off with a quick message from our team, if you stand by one. <laughs> we just, um, we just want to say thank you to everybody that's been listening with us. We, felt, we feel very close to the online community. We want to just say thank you to Falkor and Schmidt as well, and family and friends at home and um, museum community as well. So we're going to do this with a wave, everybody. And Sebastian's going to wave as well. <laughs> so there's a video with some music that you can watch on our YouTube page, Wash Your Hands, Instagram and Facebook. And we just want to say thank you and stay safe. And thanks for joining us. So thanks everybody at home and we will see you next time.